Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, my name, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Frank Chofi. I'm the technical director of Alberta Soccer. Um, just wanted to thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, as we said last week at our first webinar, uh, we tried to do something a little bit different with these um, engagement and awareness sessions, and that's to pick a theme for uh, kind of a three-week period and then investigate that theme from a coaching education perspective, from a grassroots perspective, and then from a player development perspective. So the theme we picked for the first week was around, um, you know, the behaviors. What are the good behaviors that we want out of our stakeholders, out of our participants? And last week we looked at it from a, we looked at body language of coaches. This week, um, via John Club, our grassroots manager, we're looking at behaviors from the perspective of adults within grassroots soccer. So um, I think it's a very uh, important and very practical webinar that John will present. So I'm just going to turn it over to John Club, and he will walk you through uh, what he's calling sideline winners. John, Hi, all yeah. yours. Okay, thank you. Hi, Anne. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us on this uh, beautiful St. George's Day. Um, I'm going to present quite a few slides, and I just want, if you can, to take notes as we go, and we'll do a question and review at the end. Um, I've done, done this sideline winners presentation similar to this in Airdrie last night and reflecting on the discussions last night, what was interesting is that um, like some of you who are um, coaches who have been in the game for a long time, I was a coach before I become a parent and the dilemma in Canada is quite a lot of the coaches are parents become before they become uh, parents before they become coaches. So I'm just going to go through and give a lot of ideas. Um, as someone who delivers a lot of sports psychology and mental skills, I ask questions rather than give answers. So please try and get the answers from the questions and we can review at the end. John, can I stop you there one second? Um, yeah. if, if you have questions, uh, please post them in the chat. So there's a little icon on the menu bar that's a, a word bubble. And if you just click on that, you can actually um, leave a message or ask a question in there. And then Claire Patterson and I will just Keep an eye on those questions and and um, let John know if anyone has anything specific they want to inquire about. Okay, sorry to interrupt, John. Please go ahead. No and again, if anyone wants to to raise any questions offline, I'm happy to take those on email. Um, the quote I've put there is a quote I've heard for many years in soccer. Wouldn't it be great if the parents just dropped the kids off and we could play the games? Um, not just not, not so sure I agree with the term, and I want to talk through why. And in some of the tweets I was saying about the most important people in soccer. And to be fair, I, I feel it would be the parents. Within soccer, looking back on my coaching, there are two tribes. Um, the parents' perspective, myself as a parent, I'm looking at the game here and now. Even when my sons were playing hockey, it's the game. It's a game against someone else. And how's my child going to perform? As a young coach starting out in grassroots soccer, I was always looking at the next game the next game um, and the progress over the season. So one of the th key things and the clashes is, is the perspective of parents um, opposed to coaches. And that's p a potential clash that we have when dealing with parents. Another, I'm gonna give a few slides on what is soccer as well um, and grassroots soccer, just so we understand where we are in Canada. This is an image that I quite often show at parent presentations. This is soccer in Canada. Um, it's children out playing with a ball. Yet when parents come in to see what soccer looks like, their point of reference quite often will be this. It'll be the stadium packed with fans, um, 22 professional players. And the, the rate of professional players in the world game is 0.001 make a pro contract. So really, in Alberta for soccer, we're somewhere in between the, the child on the right and the players on the left. So we've got to understand the context. If a parent is coming from the point of reference on the left, there's going to be more clashes in, in pers that perspective of how we lead the game. The next consideration is what is grassroots soccer? I've been without Berla soccer now for eight years, and this took quite a while to define. We were looking at grassroots soccer, and there's two definitions to consider. The UEFA one across all of the European countries is anything outside the professional game. Um, speaking to Canada soccer and within Alberta soccer, we're looking at the FIFA definition and that's anything under 12 years is, is a grassroots soccer program. 
It doesn't mean if you're over 12 years that you shouldn't be deemed as grassroots, but there's different streams. There's community soccer. So adults playing in a, a community league would be that. Then within community soccer, you've got recreational and competitive. Now, my, my dilemma, and I want to pose to a lot of the practitioners out there, is if it's a house or community soccer, it doesn't really matter. It's just a kick around. It's a bit of fun. And talking to some colleagues uh, in regards to this, they, they, they suggested to me, should we not just call it developmental soccer? And for me, I like the term. Um, because whether you're doing a U4 Timbits League or a U8 House League, or a tier one under 14 league. We're looking to develop. And I, I, I like the phrase, and I think it would be great if more people used it. And the quote I want to use at the bottom is, I was doing a presentation like this in a community outside of uh, Calgary. And I was I was bashing through the presentation and a parent asked, put her hand up and she said, I'm leaving soccer tonight. I want to leave the program. And I was a bit aghast. I thought I'd said something wrong again. And I asked her, why, why do you want to leave? And she said, my girl, who was probably about 10, is the girl who goes on the field. She stands in the middle of the field. No one passes to her because she's not very good. She's not very skilled. And she's not very skilled because all she's done is played games and no one's coached her on how to actually pass the ball or receive the ball. So there's no point in her being in, in, in the program. And, and it caught me because we talked around long-term player development and following a board meeting with coaches and parents, the community actually brought in the preferred training model um, and the parents understood then that we were looking to develop players and not just give a games program, not just give an event. Um, I hear it all the time. The children just want to play. Yet when I've done the preferred training model, they're happy to, the children are happy to play regardless. Um, they do want the game, but the game is more for the parents. Um, quickly, I've used this definition before. Does anyone know who the boy on the right is? I'm sure some of you will, and I'm going to come back to it in a moment. But I, again, I like the quote, and I know Jason DeVos has stolen this and is using this quite a lot. Um, the boy on the right would have started off as he is in that picture in grassroots soccer. So again, a key understanding is that we are really, really, the, the, the coaches coming into grassroots soccer are probably more important than the high performance coaches. Because if we don't do a good job, the high performance coaches never get a chance to work with players like the boy on the right. So... One more challenge I want to put out John, there. John, yep. Um, yep. We, we had one person who correctly identified the person, the player. Do you want to say who it is? Yeah. We, can that, does that person want to celebrate it and tell us who it is? <laughs> who, who is it? It's Fi. I hope I said that name right. Who correctly guessed it. Why don't you tell us who it is, John? It's Lionel Messi as a young boy. And I've got another image of him in a moment. But I want to I want to I want to go over this um, as a young coach coaching children before parenthood. I was always challenged. And I'm sure some of you have. You've not got kids. You don't know what it feels like as a parent coaching. I'm then told that I'm living vicariously through my children. And I just wondered what I have wondered for a long time. What does that mean? And reading articles recently about Tiger Woods and the Williams, the parents pushed their children but did they want to live vicariously through them? I've never wanted to live vicariously through my children, but I wanted them to be successful. So I, I want to challenge us as coaches and as parents is, do we live vicariously through our children? Or are we, are we as parents, someone who loves our children 110%, wants the best for our children, will be focal if, if we feel they're undermined. Um, and, and we really want to support the, the children rather than just trying to live vicariously through them. And so as coaches, we've got to understand that every parent is there to support their child. Um, this next graph is an interesting one, and I don't know how many of you have seen this. This was in the long-term player development program um, presentation 12 years ago. And it shows that the, the, the children want parents involved in soccer. They, they want their, their parents there. But there, there's, a, there's a bell curve that indicates we've got parents who are drop off and they'll either go off to get their Starbucks or they'll sit down and, and get on social media, not really involved, not really interested. And then we've got the no-go zone where the parents are hyperactive um, and they may be overbearing on, on, the, on the children. 
Ideally, we want the parents who are going to be active. And talking last night to this in Edry, um, some of the parents were saying, how do we get those those in the initial zone that aren't engaged into that area and in, into the program and, in, and engaged? And I pondered this for some coaching clinics years ago when I first landed in Canada. And we need to ask them individually. We, we really need to go and approach parents because when I've done this in clinics, I've actually got parents to come forward, but they needed me to offer my hand to bring them into it rather than, um, I've just used an analogy with Frank earlier on. It's like me going into a bar and asking anyone for a date. No one is going to come up to me. I need to go up to individuals. So can we go and encourage more parents to get involved? Should they be more involved? Um, and I'm, I'm going to talk to that in, in a moment. So when we look at our parents, we, we really need to try and engage them into that program and why. Now, I want to go through this. Some of you, some of you guys, the um, expats from England will know the, the parent on the right. That's uh, Ray Winston, um, a famous London actor who is a, is a gangster. But I want to ask you guys to go through these questions with me. How many of you have done this? Um, not as a coach, as a parent or as an adult. Coach from the sideline. Um, being more upset about the result than the child. Again, looking back at my coaching experience, I can remember um, when the first team I ever coached was not very good. It was double scores against driving home with players in the car and thinking about what I needed to do and what I'd done wrong to get that result. Yet the children were already disengaged. They were already on to their next thing, McDonald's or what they were going to do in the afternoon. So we, we, see, we see it totally different to children. Um, setting and expressing goals ahead of the child's stage of development. You know, we were talking about, I, I, I talk about quite a lot about learning to pass the ball too early. Um, I don't want to pass the ball, I want to play with it. Cheering and shouting aggressively, undermining the coach in any decisions or actions, measuring success by results opposed to effort, voicing criticism, um, negative and aggressive language. How many of us have actually done that? And I would, I would vouch that probably all of us have done that at some point. Um, and here I've got a video. I, I don't know if many of you have ever looked on the FA, the English FA website. This is the um, respect campaign. And it really, it's, it's Ray Winston again showing the video. It really hits home about some of the some of the key factors about coaching and, and, and being over, over aggressive. So quickly, how how have you addressed poor parental behavior? So I want to open this out, Frank, if you could ask a couple of people. If you're coaching in an environment and you've got an overbearing, aggressive parent, how have you managed that situation? Yeah, so feel free to type comments in, in the uh, chat section and we'll raise them with John. So again, if anyone's got that, um, this is this is a poster from the English FA and I, I don't really like it. It's, um, it's a silent weekend where they didn't want anyone coaching during the game. And some people may agree with this. I know working with provincial teams when we've played the North, which is a really good rivalry for 12-year-old girls um, and boys, I've actually asked my, par my, my players to ask the parents to cheer because we were in Red Deer and, and it was very, very quiet and undaunting. It's, it's going to be like when we resume soccer, the Premiership and the European leagues with no spectators. Um, how, how can we address it? And I, I don't know if this is the right way it's going too far. I think parents should be there to, to support and encourage their children. Um, one of the examples, have we got an example there, Frank? Uh, no, just well. I, there's one. Jordan said, uh, kind of conversation and education uh, discussion about the detrimental effects they have um, on the child. He asked okay. about that. And then John, I had one on a previous slide. You had mentioned kind of cheering aggressively. Yeah. So a lot of times, I know coaches have told parents, you know, don't coach, don't tell a player what to do, but cheer them on. And I find it interesting. Does that mean that the cheering can go too far as well, right? Yeah, I think so. So uh, the example I've got here is a Macclesfield U6 group. I started um, when I was working at Macclesfield Town in the community. I had an under six age group uh, session with probably 
six stations led by students and I had one dad who was very um, volatile, very, very aggressive. His child was good. He'd coached his child from a young boy and he was a good player. He was, a, he was above the other players, yet he undermined all the coaches. And there was lots of ways of approaching it. So one is education. And I could go over to him and like the image of Ray Winston earlier, I could ask him to refrain, but he's not going to. That's his personality. That's his desire. That's his drive. No matter how many times I could ask him, he would still do that. It's just in, within him. Um, other suggestions are we ban him from coming. Then his son doesn't come and he misses out. So what I actually done to address this parent was I, I went up to him and said, look, I, I love the passion. I love the in, in, encouragement that you're trying to give. I'm desperate for coaches. If I paid for you to go and do your coaching course and come in and coach within this program, could you do that for me? Um, and he sort of acknowledged what I was saying and then disappeared. I lost him from the program. His son still came, but he no longer come and coached within the program. And it made me reflect on he wanted to coach his child, but not the game. He wanted to push his child to be better, but wasn't too engaged with the others. He was actually the, co the parent coach who was asking other players to pass to his own son. So one of the, one of the tools is to understand that maybe, it's, it's like Jordan's saying, maybe the education needs to be there. They're passionate, they're engaging, they're encouraging, but they need to understand the message that you, we want as coaches as well as from the parents. Um, I hope that makes sense. I've just got a couple of little pictures to engage this. This is a short-term success that a lot of parents look at, and, and I like it because Manchester City is beating Manchester United. Um, but that's a short-term success. This is really the long-term success. This is, and I've, I've talked to this, um, we like it when we get people like Alfonso Davies playing for Bayern Munich. It's fantastic. But really, long-term success is we've got people still out socialising and playing, coaching, refereeing the game, and carrying the game forward for many years. So... Again, parents' perspective, and I'll, I'll speak to this again as a parent. I was hoping to coach my son this outdoor season. He's now uh, 20, and I just want to see him playing with a smile and banter with his friends. That's, that's for success for me. Um, coming back, I had to get a picture of him in. Um, Mr. Bielsa. I've said at the bottom, um, as coaches, we, ha we hold a massive responsibility and influence. I can remember working in Middlesbrough, uh, back home in England a few years ago, when some of you were recorded, the soccer shoes had the very long tongues, the Pumas had the big long tongues, and one of the co top coaches in the, in the programs would come in with elastic bands around his, his shoes to tie the tongue down. It wasn't long before other players started doing that. Um, all the children would copy him. And I think what we need to do is understand that, you know, I, I know there's a couple of coaches in Calgary who like to do their hair in a certain way. And as this image, there's not many children who won't mimic that. So I'm, I'm, I'm putting this one out there. Look at your behavior and see how the children model it. And then also how your parents and supporters will model it. Um, this next slide is again from my, my, my background. I was at Macclesfield Town um, when they first got promoted to the professional league. Sammy McElroy is the guy on the back of the players, he's the coach. As you can see, he's not got much hair at the front end. They got to the second division and the last 10 minutes of each game, he would be running his fingers through his hair, getting anxious and berating the referee and the team got relegated in the first season because they gave away too many goals in the last 10 minutes. Um, we had a sports psychologist come in and the players actually said, we're fit and we're strong, but we tire out in the last 10 minutes. And it was then I realized the power of the coach to influence the players and then the supporters. So I'm suggesting to you, as a coach, if you want to know what your coaching style is like, look at the players that you're coaching, look at how your team play, and then maybe also look at how your parents behave. Because if I'm the coach who's very aggressive, shouting all the time, demanding, um, challenging the referee, the players and the parents will also model that. Um, for the parents, if a parent is very volatile and, and, and um, shouting at the, the players, the players will then go to the referee. So 
what I'm really saying is, as coaches, we all hold a lot of power in the environment that we create. We really need to consider that and, and the, the parents. Ava, so how to enjoy soccer. I'm just going to put this one up quickly. Um, again, sharing the passion. I always used to share my passion with my children and I'd rarely ask them how they felt the game went. Again, um, I like talking to it because I was the coach before the parent. Rewarding positive performances and effort, not the outcome. Um, being respectful. The one that I, I'll say is how many of us have, have openly praised an opposition play in a game for our players and parents to see? Have we ever, ever done that or do we get so focused on our own team that we don't see the good play of the other of the opposition. And that, that's the key model to uh, role to model for the, the players to see that you can appreciate good play because then they will they will mimic that behavior of the opposition. I can remember going to a game a pro, a pro game and cheering in the wrong end, cheering in my home end an away goal because it was a great goal scored by Steve McManaman. And then I realized where I was. So can can we um can we support good play? Because that will reflect on the players and then also the parents. So what can coaches do? And through my over 30 years of coaching, the biggest lesson I think is be honest. Be honest with the players, be honest with yourself, and then be honest with the parents. So some, some of the tools that I've used, um, team selections. I'm just going to give a couple of stories. I was coaching a U10 team years ago out in Cochrane. And one of my boys was was a bigger boy. He um, had gone for a growth spurt really early and his coordination had gone. Um, it was a competitive team, although it was a younger team. And I put him into the game and he wasn't performing. So I brought him out, um, I had a chat with him, gave him some love and put him back in again. Um, he didn't perform. And so I brought him out. And at the end of the game, his, his dad was very athletic. His mum was a police officer. So the genes were there and I asked him to come over to me with his mum and dad and I put my arm around him and said, I love Matthias, he's a great player. Today just wasn't his day. Um, we're sticking with him and he, he will catch up and he'll, he'll, he'll have a great um, future ahead of him. At the end of that conversation, his mum and dad were pleased. They, they didn't have any challenges. They, if I hadn't done that, they would have quite probably come and challenged me why their son didn't get any game time. Um, it was because he, he was in a position where he wasn't performing and it was impacting for me his confidence. So I was just honest, if, if someone doesn't get game time, and I'll, I'll say this again, um, I've seen it where children get nervous, they sit on the bench with you, they were fine till they get to the game, they get nervous, they say they got stomach cramps, they sit down with you, so you, you don't play them because they're not feeling right. But the parents on the other side talking to other parents saying, why is coach John not playing my child? Why is he on the bench? So if that happens, go to the parents and say, this is why I didn't do that, didn't play them or something, um, or why we played them more. So there are a couple of strategies I think that coaches don't do enough. Another one is player releases. And I know I've spoken to Jordan and a few people on player releases. Um, and I've tried to refine it and be as honest as I can. And we, we were doing it last year with the provincial team. And the way I start a player release now, and I, Bear in mind, I'm saying player release. Um, I ask them when they come in if they're any good. And and I'm trying to bring down um, any of the anger that they bring in. I've had players bring in a full list of questions that they're going to challenge me on. And no player is being released because they're not good enough. It's because decisions have got to be made. So when I do that, I, I come in and we talk about the strengths that they've got and can build on rather than that they can't get in. If it's if it's a squad that you're working with, um, you might be taking 18 players, but you're only taking two left backs and two right backs. So we're, we're suggesting that um, they're not in the top two in Southern Alberta. So again, trying to be positive with the parents and the coaches to understand your perspective. The biggest lie that I've ever heard mentioned in soccer is you're too small. Um, Lionel Messi. There he is there, and he's the second on the right back row uh, from the right. So again, no one has ever told, I'm sure, Lionel Messi is too small to play. They've obviously taken him to Barcelona and built him up, 
but no one ever said that to him, to Diego Maradona, or even David Batty. Right, quickly. There is a time to talk. John, Mr. sorry, yep. John, can I stop you there? We had a, we had a comment from, from John Estevez, and he talked about how do you encourage the children to develop their own self-awareness of the skills they have gained? And I, th I think that's that's aligned to what you're describing, especially as you talked about, you know, are you any good? H how do you do that? How do you develop? A, how do you help a child develop his or her own awareness of their skills so that they have a clear a picture of where they are in their development? Yeah, I think and it it's alludes to what I'm going to be doing in a few weeks on on mental skills that I use with teams. Um, it's getting so so when, a, when I release the plan, we talk exactly about that. What are your strengths? Are you fast? Yeah, you are fast. Can you work on that? And it's it's, it's a key one when I talk to, um, you know, I'm working at one of the coll collegiate teams and we're, we're talking about the 80-20 rule. Um, as coaches, if I coached Dave Beckham when he was a young boy in England, he would probably have made it to Accrington Stanley because I would have seen that he's purely right-footed and tried to get him to use his left foot and that would have inhibited his development. So again, as coaches, we, we need to get children to recognize what their strengths are. Um, was David Beckham the one of, was he uh, an elite soccer player? I'm not so sure. He was very good at his right foot. He was very good at crossing and he made the most of what he had. Um, so I think there's, there's times and when we work with players, I would say we should be spending about two, three hours of every hour we spend on the field, we should be spending that with those relations with the players and understanding them. Um, I allude to it when I talk to parents, I, I'll stand in front of them and I'll tell them I've been coaching since I was 20, so like last 10 years, um, but I don't coach soccer. I, I, I don't see myself as a soccer coach anymore. I'll be frank, it, it bores me at times. I coach players to play soccer. So if I'm working with the provincial team, I'll coach the girls within that team to play soccer, but I won't coach soccer. So I think that's that's the other message. And when I explain that to parents, they get that I'm not going to coach the game. I'm going to coach individual players and, and it, it resonates with them. It hits home. So I think that's the key for, for us to understand. Coach the player before the game. Um, this model I want to explain is, is from a friend of mine who's a counsellor and it, it really hit home. When we have conflict, it's quite often conflict caused by talking over and across to people. So we've seen the parent who will come up to the coach and say, like I said earlier, you haven't got children. There's conflict. The coach who turns around to a child and says, look, will you stop behaving like a baby? Um, we can't be, when, when it's time to talk, if I'm talking to a coach, we need to communicate as coaches. If I'm talking to a parent, I need to speak in the language that they understand. Um, and we need to do the same with, with players. Um, so again, there's no assumptions drawn by parents. I think the biggest conflict is when we don't engage parents, when we don't tell them our thoughts. So going back earlier, um, with the teams that I've done, um, I've always given a, a quick summary review of the performance of a game. I do this for two reasons. One, for me, it helps me to reflect on the performance and what I need to work on and the players need to work on. And then I'm, I'm supporting my, my reflection to the parents. Um, in doing that, I know the children, if they're younger, will certainly not read the match report. And the parents will skim read it until they find their child's name or a friend's name. And then they'll say what was really good. So one of the things I used to, I, I had a team that had two very good selfish goal scorers. They were, they were banging in goals for fun. And there was one game where Chris played it through to Peter and Peter scored an open goal. Chris could have gone by himself. So I praised the passing options that they, the two boys decided at nine years of age. And what the message was for the parent was to see that I wasn't looking at the outcome. It was how we got there. And then hoping that they would support that with their own children. That Coach John is looking for us to, to try and play like this. So again, think about the conflicts that we may have had as parents and as coaches. Quite often we followed those red lines and not gone in the conversation as an adult to adult or coach to coach or child to child. Um, so I hope that makes some sense. Again, this is what we see when our kids start playing soccer. We get the replica kit. 
and he, he uh, had a good career. He didn't have me as a coach, otherwise it was Accrington Stanley. Um, that's the that's a dream. That's a potential reality. I don't see many top level professional players there. Um, that's the provincial coaches all from last year. So some of you may be in that picture. But again, when we look at our career path, um, Sylvie Bellevue from Canada Soccer had done a great presentation um, a few years ago. And she stood on, on the stage and put a ball up. And she said, this is a magic ball. Um, and what people were looking at, it's just a soccer ball. And if you look at the backgrounds of all of those people and where they've traveled from across the world, Soccer is a great game and it's given us a great opportunity to travel, meet people, engage. Some of us work professionally in the game and, and create a different path from the dream that we had of playing in front of thousands of people in a World Cup. So again, as, as parents, as coaches and as players, we've got to realise there's lots of paths that will come off from the, the, the game, whether it's the old boys playing in their local community, whether we go into coach and coach development, or whether we do actually make that 0.001% of players. So quickly, and I'm coming towards the end, and so I want to open it out to questions in a minute. Um, whatever age the child, they all seek approval from significant, significant others. And it's, it's interesting when I reflect, I remember sitting in a bleachers once with a mum whose son was in goal. And I, I said this, and I said about when he makes a save, watch what he does. He'll look straight to you for approval. So, so make sure you smile um, and, and think about it. As, as very young children, they do. They seek the, the approval from parents, coaches. So again, when we're, when we're on that sideline, those positive behaviours are really, really important um, to show approval. I've, I've seen it before where players are upset because they've looked at the coach and the coach is frowning and they think it's about their performance. And it may be about something totally different. It may be they're warming their substitutes up and the sub isn't stretching properly. So we've got to be considerate on, on our mannerisms. I, I think last week Matt talked about um, body language and it's the key communication within a game. So bear in mind we are the role models. Um, a shocking life lesson I've realised and a friend said this, it looks like my twin, it's actually my son when we were over at Wembley last year. Um, as parents, your children do resemble you, sometimes physically, but looking at all three of my boys, they're all different. Um, as one of four boys, I thought we'd all be the same, we're not. But you will see models and parts of your children's behaviours in you. So whether you're the parent or the coach, they will mimic you. Um, I, I started adopting a word when I was coaching the girls of go play beautiful. It was come from a song, the song, um, that is why you're beautiful. The girls used it as their anthem. I adopted it and I still use it. And I've seen other coaches mimic it off of me. So again, please, we are the role models. Let's consider how we do support players. So lots of slides. I have got lots of time for questions after this. Um, support the players to play. Don't coach the game. Um, coach the players to play the game. Model the behaviour you expect. Um, Ian Skitchell was with us, used to say, the standards you set are the standards you get. So again, what do you expect from your players and your parents? One of the keys that we did mention recently was, I, I, I'd done this on a presentation and someone said that we should have a, a really formal meeting at the beginning of the season and tell the players and the parents the expectations and rules of engagement. And I sort of frowned because I've, I've been in that situation where the coach is telling the parents how to behave. And being an A-type personality, I, I didn't like it. I was uncomfortable. So what I've done with all my teams is I asked them to come up with the rules. And could you do this with your, your players and your parents? Ask them to come up with the rules. They are going to come up with the same rules as what you do as a coach, the same rules as what every player I've ever, every group I've ever worked with. Um, be punctual, be respectful. Um, practice hard, uh, support one another, um, language, should we use language, what's appropriate, and then what are the consequences? So rather than always setting the standard, could you ask your parents to set the standard? And then they're going to be accountable to those. Um, 
the last point I'm saying there, recognize we all evolve. And I'm sure there's a few people watching who have seen me coach and will say positive behaviors, don't shout too loud. He's done that. Um, we've all done that. And I think it's it's important to recognize my coaching style is very, very different from when I started with that first team. Um, going away last year with the provincial team, I told the other coaches that we were going, my team was going to win every single game. And I think we won one, we drew two, and we lost one. And the one we lost, I had lots of coaches sort of smiling and saying, well, you lost. I thought you were going to win. And I said, we did win. Um, the other team scored more goals. The players played a game plan that we set out to play and put on a display. And I was, I was proud that 10 of the girls got, 18 girls got into the game of distinction. So again, I've, I've evolved and maybe I should be more demanding to get the result. But again, I'm recognizing with young players, I'm looking to develop the, um, the player development rather than the outcome. And I've got it here. Um, I hear lots of conversations, development over outcome, development over outcome, youth soccer. And we're looking at this even in the PDP, um, lots of people talking about player development, but straight away we've got player coaches who are looking to get stronger players into that squad. So when that whistle goes, development at the moment is is going out and we're getting on to achieving an outcome. And is, is that what we want for our players? When does the outcome really, really count? So it's, it's a cultural shift and a philosophy shift. Um, can, we, can we be looking to focus on the player before the outcome? So coming back, the most important people in soccer. Um, it's not myself. It's not even Matt Thomas, manager of coach education. He's very important. We're all important. But the most important people are going to be the young parents coming into the game now because they're going to be the people that take us this game forward for Alberta. And they're the future coaches, officials and administrators. They're going to, they're going to be the future of the game. So we as coaches present need to be really um, cogniz cognizant of that and supporting the, the players for the future. Has anyone, so I hope, I hope this has given a lot of insight and thought. Um, I'm going to open it out now to any questions and feedback from you guys and hopefully uh, some discussion. Yeah, John, we had a couple of comments and questions, um, which I'll just highlight. And then if you want to comment on them, uh, first of all, Daniel said Beckham is football. I'm not sure as a non-Man United fan you agree with that, but that's that's what he said. So, uh, so yeah, can I address these? Is one so I, I, I that was just a little comment. I don't. We don't need. I we we don't unless you want to talk about David. Yeah, Beckham. no, I, I do. It's an important one. Um, I, I've been challenged here before. Um, when I go to England, I watch football. Um, but I'm a soccer coach in Canada, and I I do. Um, I think it's important that sometimes. I, I feel passionate about it. It's, it's a cultural thing. There's a difference in, in how we play the game there and how it's perceived here. So, so yeah, David Beckham was a footballer in England and a soccer player in the States. Is there a difference? I, I think there is a slight difference in how we coach and how we support the game. So yeah. I hope that sort of makes sense. Okay. We had a, we had a comment from Michael who said, uh, it's just a comment, uh, an observation, he said, I've had kids tell me that they wish their parents would watch their games and not their phones. The kids do notice when, and that's kind of the behaviors you were talking about. They look for that acknowledgement and that um, that support from their parents who are on the sideline. So I thought that was an interesting, it aligned to what you were saying about um, kids noticing what their parents are doing. We had a question from Jay about, you know, what role does teaching sportsmanship play in grassroots development? I think it's it's massive. And, you know, if we go back to the last comment, you know, where the parents set out the expectations, um, you know, when the game's going on, parents, please put your phones away. You know, as, as a coach going to a game and scouting, if I'm on my phone when I should be scouting, the children notice that as well. In terms of sports, sportsmanship, so I've not alluded to it here and I'll do it in another presentation, preferred training model. We want players not necessarily... Uh, um, selected on in grassroots in teams because in teams we're we're creating rivalries we're creating adversaries um, so we do want children to come together and recognize again it's recognizing good play um, so I talked to it last night how do you coach the ball hog if you've got the, the boy who is the ball hog in the team 
And, you know, we hear it all the time. Oh, you put him in goal. You uh, can find him to two touches if he scored four goals. Instead of celebrating him and saying, go play, can you do it more? Like um, Lionel Messi did. We should be celebrating him because then other people will want to model him. So, so we, we need to... We need to applaud and recognise good behaviours. Um, whether that is team play, whether it's the child who's helping the coach with the equipment at the end, whether it's good play within the session. And, and it could be a passing move, it could be a dribbling move, but we, as coaches, we, we can support that. Um, I don't, you know, looking back on my career, I don't think it's, it's appropriate to maybe address poor behaviours as a big group. Um, but support the positive ones and, and be that role model. We, we need to walk it as well. Okay, uh, we had a comment from John about unreal, unrealistic expectations put on children. Um, if we're expecting 100% effort 100% of the time um, and pushing kids because they're gonna play at the collegiate level. And if you do that, you damage the child's love for the game uh, and break their self-confidence. I think that's something you would concur with, John. Don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of smiling because we, we do see it. And, and, and that's, that's the precarious part, I think, maybe that people look at. Um, and I want my child to go as far as they can. And I think it's what we can address is everyone will find their own way. You know, I, I, I see and I hear a lot of people paying a lot of money to get a scholarship and they probably spend more, as much money getting to a scholarship as they would get in a scholarship. Um, <laughs> so, you know, um, with, with showcase events, with travel, with hotels, with extra tech. And, you know, I, I, want, I want to speak to this at the moment. You know, we're in a really unprecedented time with this. It's, it's, it's an incredible time with social isola isolation. And I, I this is the pressure I think we put ourselves under. And we've got and, you know, we ourselves are at fault. We're, we're sending our own players homework to, to, to do work at home. Practice 100 juggles. Practice your left foot. Um, can you slam dunk from a header? And children are, are feeling, I think, more pressure. And as coaches, we're getting, we're pressured to justify our existence by sending this home to players. Parents are asking for it because their kids are bored and the club down the road is doing it. They're doing it, so we need to do it. And one of my thoughts is it would be interesting to send a send your child into the backyard with a ball and just say, you've got 30 minutes, go play. Just go play see, and see what they do because the players will play and they'll be the boys and girls who play when they come back. They'll go out and find a trick and they'll find a way to work on their left foot. Um, and that, that comes out from within them. If we're driving them to do these moves, um, and they're struggling. I certainly can't do around the world. Um, when I get my free time, I spend it on my bike. If I try and do around the world, I'm going to get very, very frustrated. And one of the dilemmas I feel with this current situation is we're putting pressure on kids to keep up because they may not make the team when the league comes back. When the league does come back, we're going to be doing tryouts really quickly. When we've done the tryouts, we're going to be doing tactical coaching. Then we're going to be into the league season. And then we're going to have the relapse again and we're going to come back to maybe this scenario. So I, I just think the expectations we're putting on, we've got to remember their children um, and we need we need them to play. So I, 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 done a, um, I submitted something recently from Mental Skills, the most important corner from the four corner model of player development. You have technical, tactical, psychological, physical and social. They're the four corners. And for me, the most important corner when I look at a group of players is the social. This is a great time to be linking your players and working on the social. I saw um, Dave at Scottish has just done um, the dream team with his team, come up with their own on Zoom. So rather than sending homework and asking kids to complete a, a technical task without support, can we can we can we use this time really for social engagement and making the players strong and confident and maybe reflecting on, on some of the stuff that they're good at. So I, again, I've gone around about it a bit, but I think it's, it's an important um, consideration for all players, especially grassroots at the moment. It's the time to sort of reflect back and, and, and find that lovely game without being pushed to achieve. Okay. Thank you, John. A couple other questions. 
Ahmad was asking specifically, thinking of U11s and Tier 1 at the Tier 1 level, the difference between Canada and England in terms of coaches and parents. Um, it's If you want the analogy, you look at hockey and soccer here. Um, in England, everyone is an expert and everyone is a Pep Guardiola. And that's I, I've not been there for 12 years and, and seen the behaviours from the parents. I know they've They've had to do a lot of work to address that. Um, if you look at the different style of play, I think, you know, and some of the, the expats from England will vouch and the boys who have, and girls who have been over there, the game there is a lot more physical, um, a lot more challenging. Um, so technically, um, the children here are, are very good, but I think it's 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 going to be the physical side of the game. It's It's the passion over there. And I know from when I was coaching there, lots of Canadians would come over and you wonder about how much they want it compared to the children in, in Europe. And working, like I say, at a college, there's three Germans joined the team this year and they just ooze soccer. They're yeah. not, not playing it, they just ooze everything, the tactics, they, they see it differently. So in order to address that, we need, we need I, want, I want to put this one out there, um, I was at a camp last year and a coach asked how many children want to make professional soccer players and they all put their hand up. He then asked how many children know what CPL is and half of them that put their hand up. He then asked how many children have been to watch FC Edmonton because we were in Edmonton and very few had been. And he said, well, if you want to, if you want to be a professional soccer player, you need to support the professional program because this is your first step into that. So I think a lot of times parents are looking abroad instead of looking at home. And, you know, I, I will advocate if, if, if we want soccer to grow here, we need to go and watch it. Um, one, for our own development and two, to support that extra lung, rung on the ladder. Okay. And then we had a question from Blaine, John, and it's a scenario that I, he's looking for how to do kind of a positive intervention given this scenario. And the scenario he describes is, you know, at the end of a game, a parent will take their their son or daughter uh, off the field and uh, talk to them. And you can clearly see that the, that the parent is giving the kid an angry lecture on his or her performance. So what what advice would you give on the ability of, of a coach to be able to positively affect that interaction? It's an interesting one and it's contextual. You've got to understand the context. You know, I, I've had a situation like that where a, a child was getting remonstrated quite uh, aggressively and the other players recognised it. And they, the other players rallied around the girl so the parents could see that. Um, the parents in the end came to me and they were upset that I wasn't getting her into a game. We had a, It was a four game um, series and I wasn't getting her in to get a chance to get in the game of distinction. And they said, why did you bring her? She's not playing. I said, because I've got to play. And again, it's, it's being honest. I've got to play. I've got 18 players. I can only play 11. I've got to rotate them in. She will get a game. She's here because she's a good player. And I had to support that. The player is good. Um, and if, if a player is not performing well, we need to talk to them about that. Why are they not playing well? Maybe they're too pressured. Maybe they need to um, be able to enjoy it. Maybe the parent needs to see what the child does really well compared to what they get graded about. So if you if you've any team we see has probably got two or three uh, players who are out there. They the, the children all relieve the the team, and then the rest will be following through. So if if I'm comparing apples to pears, I've got to look at my apples. And so if you've got David Beckham on the team. You, you can't compare your child to David Beckham all the time. You've got to compare him to where he is. So, again, yeah, I think it's it's getting them to see their child and not the game. Would you suggest that you, you as the coach would, would, inter, would have that kind of conversation in that moment or do you give it, like, time for everything to settle down and then have that conversation with the parent out at a later date outside of the you know, kind of the energy of the moment. I Again, that's a good one because I know a lot of people go by the 24-hour rule and I, I really don't like that. Um, it depends on the context. Why I don't like the 24-hour rule is, is if two, if a parent is very upset with me as a grassroots coach, um, they're going to go and talk to another set of parents. And this is my assumptions. It's the Chinese whispers. 
So Frank, I don't like Coach John. He's never playing our kid. Is Frank going to agree with them or disagree? And say, actually, Coach John's really good, and he's doing this for the team. No, they're probably going to agree. So this is where, and again, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, I'd done a team many years ago, um, a high-level team in, in England, a girls' team at Millwall. And I wanted, as a young coach, I wanted to just coach the girls. I didn't want to get involved in the politics of parenting. So I didn't. We played an FA Cup uh, semi-final in Stockport and the week later the team disbanded. We lost uh, that game and the team disbanded. Half the parents took the team to form. And I didn't, it's the mafia thing, Frank. Um, keep the, your friends close, your enemies closer. You need to engage the parents all the time. If you see someone who's being volatile and challenging you, then have a parent meeting and explain your philosophy. Um, I've just helped a friend do this with a team. If a parent is being very aggressive and overbearing to their child, then go and have that conversation. And that's what I'd done with that other example. It was getting overbearing. They were they were really impacting their daughter. And in the end, I went towards them and I didn't have to ask anything. They 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 wanted to question why I wasn't playing. And I explained the logistics of how many players I could play. I confirm that their child is very good and I, I recognize that they're good and they will get the chance um, that's what they that's what they wanted to hear so so again context if, if, if you think it's harmful and it is really impacting the child do it there and then if if you've got time but the, the 24 hour rule you know I think parents go home they get on the phone and you've you, you're undermined by half the team then yeah. so I, I would sooner nip it in the bud but again that's the confidence of a coach um, who's been in the game for 30 years. Um, as a young coach, just starting out, would I do that? Maybe not. If I wasn't prepared, I'd need to go to maybe the club technical director and ask them to come in and address it with me. And get support. Sure. Yeah. That sounds good. Um, no other questions. Any final thoughts, John, before we wrap up for the day? No, I just think, like I say, um, thank you for coming on, guys. It is, it is grassroots. Um, Again, this is grassroots, as I keep saying, and every situation is going to be different. Every community, every club is different. Um, but I, I go back to the responsibility that we hold as leaders. Um, I will talk to things like the preferred training model and in, in future sessions. And for me, love the opportunity in the game. You know, I, I look back and I've, I've never done a day's work in my life um, because you go out and you, you, we're doing what we really enjoy. And engage the parents. P please engage them, bring them into the fold um, because they're going to be your support uh, mechanism as well as um, challenge you. So they they are there for a really good reason and they are, probably are the most important people to grassroots soccer. Okay. Thank you very much, John. Um, just some final thoughts and notes before we wrap up. Um, next week, next Thursday, We'll do the behaviors kind of theme from a player's perspective and player behaviors. Um, and then I just want to highlight in the chat, there's a link to a feedback form for these webinars, as well as the link to the FA video that John mentioned uh, earlier in the presentation. We did take a recording of the webinar, so we'll put that up on our web page uh, so that uh, folks who didn't or aren't able to attend live can have access to it uh, offline. And again, uh, just want to thank you all for attending. Uh, continue to be safe in this challenging time. Hope everybody is okay, and we'll talk to you next week. Thanks very much.